like to take credit, but I think uh, most of the ideas came from uh, that book. And uh, Miss Berman has written four other books on bar success. She has a long uh, background in legal education, has been at four law schools before uh, going to Access Lex in Washington, D.C., where she is now. She has uh, written, as I said, five books, published many articles. She's worked in the academic success field. She's worked as a, a professor. She's worked as an administrative team of the law school. So she's done it all in terms of how law schools work and understands that. She also has a love for working with, I picked that up immediately, for working with uh, students. And that that's something that in this field you really have to have uh, to, to enjoy it and to pull for people. Sometimes when they're in their most stress they've ever experienced. Um, and you know, that's, that's a real gift I think she has. Um, and aside from the wise advice that I think you'll hear today. Um, and so I just want to thank her for coming here and sharing her wisdom. She said, we're going to want to cover some topics early and leave time for a question and answer. So if we don't fully develop something that you're interested in, you can uh, follow up in the question and answer. <clears throat> and then also, you can always email me and I'll email uh, Ms. Berman. And who knows, I might put it on the uh, have Mary Bunch put it in the the all law student uh, uh, email. You blog about it. I could blog about it. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there you go. Uh, okay, so now we're I'm into the fireside chat mode. Um, how are you doing? <laughs> it's really great. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm doing great, and I wanted to just say that it is such an honor to be here with all of you, and I'm, I'm so appreciative of the warm welcome, and very excited to support you in any way that I can. Along those lines, uh, in your book, <laughs> Past the Bar, uh, I was struck by the bar success plan you discuss in there, having students before they're ever in that uh, after graduation period of uh, intense bar preparation, having a, well before that, having a bar success plan. Can you describe that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I do, did take a couple notes, so in case uh, I forget some pieces of it, there are so, uh, also are a lot more subtleties and details in the book, so I do recommend reading the book. But largely, a bar success plan is your strategic plan. If you were running a business, you'd have a strategic plan. You would have a sense of where you're going to be in one year, three years, five years. You would know the resources you have to get there. You would have a road map. You would understand the financial landscape. You would understand the challenges. And you would have plans to overcome those challenges. And that's all that the bar success plan is. It's your personal strategic plan for passing the bar because you need that to get into the next phase, which is to change the world for the better and become a lawyer and do all the wonderful things that you intend to do with that. But there is that little quiz you have to do before <laughs> then, and this plan will help you get there. Do you find that students uh start learning there's a lot more to do in preparing for the bar than they may have ever realized? Absolutely. Um, the strategic plan or bar success plan is much more than just learning torts, contracts, criminal law, all of which you have to learn along with the other subjects. And super pro. And super pro, <laughs> right? I, I think last I counted in Virginia you have 24 subjects. Uh -huh. Yeah, if you take the right. Virginia bar, which we'll talk about a little more. But I have, I'll just put a couple of the pieces of the plan, but there are others. But one is to understand the exam. And what do I mean by that? Know what's tested, know when it's tested, know for how long it's tested, how long do you have to sit. Show of hands, how many of you study in three hour uninterrupted blocks 
What I mean is never going to the bathroom during those three hours, not drinking uh, uh, you know, a soda, not uh, stopping to check your phone or chit chat with a friend. I'm not saying you should, I'm just asking. How many study in three hour uninterrupted blocks? Okay, I rest my case. <laughs> This is why we need to plan and prepare, because that's what you're gonna be expected to do on the bar exam. So you don't want the bar exam to be the first time you do that. You want training, you want preparation, you wanna lay the groundwork. So understanding the exam is really the first piece of the plan. And there's a couple of other important aspects. One is to commit the time and the money. And we're gonna talk a little bit more that it costs money to live for two months while you're studying for the bar exam. And we'll talk a little more about that aspect. Combating distractions. We live in a world filled with distractions. Many of them good and positive and wonderful, but they nonetheless invade your study time. And you have to develop a plan and strategies to combat those distractions. So maximizing your study schedule is something that we talk about and you commit to on paper in the plan. Uh, a couple of other pieces, plan everything ahead of time that you can plan that's not the studying so that you can be free to focus on the studying. What do I mean by that? Well, you're gonna have to get to the bar exam. You're probably gonna have to stay over at the bar exam. You're going to have to pay rent during those months. You may have an animal to care for. You may have a family member to care for. You may have other obligations, and you have to take care of all those ahead of time. You have a moral character and fitness application to complete. There are so many details. I, I used to liken it to planning a wedding. I now liken it to planning the Mars mission. It's a little <laughs> bit more complicated you would not go wing the Mars mission, right? And you don't go and wing the bar exam. So the success plan focuses on all those things and one extra secret ingredient that I know Professor Madison and I uh, and Dean Gant and I share a lot of uh, 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 camaraderie in our view of how important this piece is, and that's your confidence and motivation. And the plan helps you shore up your confidence Focus on the can-do aspects of this, because if you have made it through your first semester of law school, which I think is everybody in this room, you can pass the bar exam. And this group right here, you're a mixture, how many one else? Woo, I love that. How many two L's? And three L's? Woo. Okay, <laughs> Woo. all right. Well, you three L's, what's your bar pass rate gonna be this year? objective it's a goal I want you to soar with fly with and you will get there Amen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. you're right this is something that Dean Gant and I really focus on because uh, we were talking about rephrasing and I, I was telling the students now that they come and meet with me if they say something like I'm not any good at this I'll say will you please rephrase that <laughs> Uh, I am making progress in this area. And they look at me like I'm a, you know, a, a nut. Uh, maybe I am. Uh, but, uh, but what do you have to say about that area, you know, that concept? Is that what you're talking about? Yes, and I think if you're a nut, you're a really smart nut. Well, thank so, you. Uh, and what I mean by that is, this is what motivates us. It's now backed up by learning science. There have been a number of empirical studies that have suggested and proven with significant bodies of research that what we call the growth mindset is effective and it prevails every time over the opposite, which is called a fixed mindset. So an illustration, I'm not good at math. No, rephrase, I am working hard to get better at algebra, at geometry, at calculus, at statistics, at whatever piece it is, it's focused. It's not a massive, frightening thing that is just too big to tackle. It's a piece 
and I'm going to improve. And it's so important with respect to the bar exam because there is nothing that should surprise you on the bar exam. I like to say, you're not going to walk into the bar exam and get an essay that's written in German. Not going to happen. You're not going to get an essay on maritime law. You are going to get exactly what the bar examiners lay out for you and tell you will be on the exam, which means that you can prepare for it, which means for all your 1L classes, you have a chance to revisit this material. So no matter what you got, no matter what your grade work was, even if you were the last person in terms of your class rank, you revisit that material, it looks much more doable the second time around. You have a command and insights that you didn't have the first time, and you go in with the mastery you need to pass the test. So it is so important. It probably, if you take away nothing else from this, it's rephrased positively to can do, I will pass. I will pass the bar exam. And that's the, you're talking about not just saying things, it's thinking. Yes. If you have thoughts that, that are saying, oh, I'm never going to do this, and you have to change, you know, it takes 30 days, they say, to make a new habit. You start, start making <coughs> Some of, I mean, quite frankly, um, I still have to rephrase things in my own mind uh, to keep it in this moving forward. I mean, having a faith, I think, helps considerably because I can say, okay, I'm going to do the footwork and I'll turn it over to God, the result over to God. And that's something that gets through, gets through the hard times. And, and, and this is an endurance test, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, the phrase that everybody tosses around that's really accurate is, it's a marathon, not a sprint. And if you think about yourself as a lifelong learner, you're entering the practice of law. It's not just the next year, the next few months, the next three years. It's a lifetime of learning and growing and continuing to change and develop new and positive habits. Uh, so absolutely what you're saying is true. I remember you also mentioned uh, staying away from toxic people. Uh, so you choose who you are around. I mean, not that there are any toxic people around here. It's just out there in the world. They're toxic. You know the kind of folks that are always just saying negative stuff. You got to really, I mean, they'll, they'll take you down. Yeah. And there are some specific exercises that I put into the book that you keep confidential, you know, share with other people, but really kind of trying to outline who's good for you during that time. Who's going to maximize your confidence? Who's going to respect the fact that this takes a lot of time. And that's not something that's ill-intentioned. There are a lot of people, many of you may have family members, who, I don't know if this is a familiar refrain, oh, you're so smart, honey. You can knock this out in a weekend. You don't <laughs> need to spend two weeks studying for finals. You can attend X event, Y event. You can go on a family vacation. I don't know if you've ever had a student, but I know I have, who've planned massive family reunions, weddings, all sorts of events right before the bar exam. No, no, <laughs> no. You need to protect your time, but it's incumbent on you to educate your family, your friends, your world, and let them know you're not disappearing for good. You'll be back in August, but you need, you need this time to focus because it's for a higher purpose. You're getting a license that is going to enable you to do well for yourselves and your families, but also to do good. And it's going to be a lifetime license if you guard it fiercely and protect it. And it is worth this investment. It will, will be with you for the rest of your life, helping you. It's a power tool. It enables you to, I call a legal education a power tool for social change. A power tool for social change. That's what you're investing in. Before I forget, we, we talked about the BAR uh, success plan. Part of that is a BAR preparation fund, and I really thought that it was a great idea, so I'd like you to mention it to folks. 
Right, so those of you who are third years know this, but other people in the room, everybody should know that it is uh, not part of your typical student loan package to have loans continue during the time of summer bar prep. Uh, you may need to invest in private separate loans. You also need to save for that time because you will have costs. You will have a cost of living. You will hopefully, and we'll talk about this more, not have to work during that time because you are competing against people who are not working. Now, when I say competing, let me make clear. You all 100% in this room, you are not competing against each other, you are competing with each other. But you are competing against those of people in the room who are sitting from other schools, right? Only certain amounts of people in the room will pass the bar exam. All of you will, but there will be some people out there who won't. And if any of them don't have to work and you do, it's like I said to Professor Madison earlier, it's a little bit like me running a marathon against Professor Madison, and I'm wearing a 25 pound pack on my back, and I'm wearing huge hiking boots, and he's decked out in running gear. Who's gonna have the easier time? If you have to work and if you have a lot of other responsibilities, it will be a weight on you. It's not impossible, and there's a lot of material in the book directed toward how to incorporate uh, uh, dependent care, family care, child care, etc., and other things. But it is very, very important. So seeding, S-E-E-D-I-N-G, seeding a bar fund from day one of law school or third years from right now will help you to be the person who's free to run and soar like the wind. So I usually say start it off with what I call a latte a day. And I'm not trying to be snobby in saying that. I know that there are many people who cannot afford a latte a day, and I'm very mindful of that. But I also know that we all spend money on things that sometimes with a little planning, we could save a little money on. So that was an example that came to mind of brewing your own coffee. Maybe you can save a few dollars a day. Maybe it's packing a lunch. Maybe it's some other things. And if you can sock away $3 a day at the beginning of law school, that more than pays for a bar review and starts helping to pay for cost of living. Uh, in addition to that, if you have any family or friends who want to give you birthday gifts, Christmas gifts, ask them to contribute instead of giving you a gift to your bar fund. Uh, maybe they'll be inclined to give even more because it's for such a good cause, right? The other thing is, and this is the last piece I would say for now, but it's more complex, is save gift cards. If anyone gives you a gift card, even a $5 Starbucks card, save it for the bar summer mm -hmm. because there will be a day when you're studying like crazy and boy, just looking in your wallet and finding that gift card and thinking, oh, uh, now I can treat myself to that latte. It'll be just a wonderful surprise and lift that'll get you through the day. So I think a bar fund is doable, and I think it's important, and I know from many students, it's super helpful. You, you mentioned time before. Um, what about the, uh, the, the student or the student still. The bar taker. Once you graduate, you become a bar taker or, or applicant. That's how we refer to you. You're still a student to me. Right. Uh, but uh, what about someone who does have other, right now, is going to sit for the bar in July. What, what could they do such as early start, perhaps, with the bar prep? So uh, it's a fantastic question, and early start is near and dear to my heart. I think we could all use more than two months to prepare for this exam. Uh, and certainly, whatever time you have, leverage. And um, some very concrete things you can do, especially those of you about to go into bar season soon, you can take a bar review outline, and I know that your school has access to wonderful bar review materials. Uh, and uh, that the bar review company that you work with provides your professors really great resources for you, you can take an outline and define all the terms so that when you go into a bar review lecture, it is review, bar review, and not bar learning. 
You're actually familiar with the terms. So you're not sitting there saying, oh yeah, what was an easement again? I don't remember. Um, that one usually gets people. Uh, uh, and uh, so that's a really low hanging fruit in terms of early start. The other thing is if there are any subjects that are on your bar that you didn't take in law school, you can use a little time now on some weekends to read a reliable horn book and I'm sure that your professors can give you suggestions, either that or to look through the bar review materials, so that you're not going in again with a whole lot of brand new bar learning. There is also, I think, a week between graduation and the start of bar review. That's a really important time to get rolling, to get rolling on your daily schedule, to get digging into the material, to do a preview of some of the material you're gonna have, and you don't think a week is a lot of time, but think about how much you learned. You don't have to answer this out loud. Just think for yourself about how much you learned in two or three days before certain finals. <laughs> you can learn a lot in the amount of time you're given if you leverage it and if you use it to your advantage. So early start is a must, and those of you first years and second years, you can really be strategic in developing an early start plan so that you don't have to rush, you don't have to stress, it's a little bit at a time. Tortoise and the hare, slow and steady wins the race. In other words, each bar prep company right now would has uh, materials that you can start doing your bar review before you take finals. And yes. as three L's, I may get I may get in trouble for saying this, but I'll say, how much do you think it's going to change your GPA in the last semester of law school? Okay, it's usually a fraction. I think there's some mathematical thing involved there. <laughs> um, but we talked about spending time on preparing for the bar, especially if you're in Virginia with 24 subjects and 60% of the exam being nine essays. I mean, not just Virginia procedure folks, I see my Virginia procedure students. We got 24 subjects, many of which aren't even taught in law schools that the bar examiners ask on. I mean, taking time now, starting now, what, what do you think of that? I think it's an absolute must. And I think what you're doing by doing that is giving yourself a gift. You are really, really giving yourself a gift because one of the most stressful pieces of bar review is the quantity of material, right? I think you'll find, and, and I think you folks would agree with me on this, nothing on the bar exam is more complicated. No one test is more complicated than what you're doing in law school. You're already there. You've already proven yourself. Law school's hard. You're getting through it, and you're doing great if you're even still in the game. So what I mean by that is every single person, no matter what your class rank, if you're in the bottom third or the top third of the class, you're still gonna pass the bar exam first time around, and you're going on to be a wonderful lawyer. And you are not going to find the bar exam that difficult piece by piece. What's difficult is that it's juggling 24 subjects in your head at once. And if you take the UBE in another jurisdiction, it's not quite that many subjects, but it's still far more than you're dealing with in law school. When you went in to take your torts exam, you weren't thinking, oh, I wonder if they'll test on torts or contracts or crim law or maybe civil procedure. You knew you were going to be tested on torts. When you go into the bar exam, it's rapid fire. It could be any one of these subjects. So it's preparing for a comprehensive test. That's what I call a multi-subject test. A comprehensive test that takes that extra early preparation. And so it will be a gift to start early and make sure that bar review is truly review. And what it does is take the anxiety off. Because when you go in and realize, oh my lord, I have to learn, fill in the blank, five subjects, 10 subjects, you know, whatever's brand new to you, and I have to review another 20 subjects, it often fills people with a tremendous amount of anxiety that you can go a long way to reduce 
by gaining that early start familiarity with the subject matter. Uh, I have to clarify, by the way, to protect myself. I'm not suggesting you don't uh, study for your finals. <laughs> Do, but we're talking about spending a couple of hours a day on early start as well. Well, uh, and that's all I'm suggesting. Let me, let me add one more point to that. I, I also think that it will make you stronger for your finals that you're taking now. Because even studying another subject gives you insight into other subjects. So it's don't think of it as a zero-sum game. Think of it as a pie that's going to just grow. Uh, and the more you learn, you're a sponge. The more you learn, the more you can learn. It's not finite. Your brain is not like a disc that runs out of space. It is a living, breathing, growing phenomenon. And the more you learn about the law, the more you can learn about the law. So I don't even think taking that time away will hurt you in any way preparing for your finals. I think it will help you. Well, it's decided. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm going to ask one last question, and then we'll do the questions and answers. Okay. You mentioned anxiety, and I never really appreciated anxiety until I started working with bar takers. Uh, and I mean, it is a time when it can become overwhelming. What what other suggestions do you have for dealing with that reality? So there are five, we could we discussed this earlier. We could probably have a five-hour seminar on that at least without stopping to. Uh, uh, even take a drink of water. This is near and dear to my heart. I think it's very, very real. And anyone who says that the bar exam is not that hard hasn't taken one in a while. Okay? Uh, it is. And you have every right to be concerned and a little bit of stressed out anxiety uh, creeps in. But there's a lot that you can do to protect yourself. And the most important thing, I think, is to know that you're not alone. You are among an incredible fellowship of people here who support you every step of the way and who know what you're going through. And that goes a long way to validating your feelings. There are a host of self-care uh, actions that you can take that will really help a lot, including but not limited to exercise. And you don't have to become a marathon runner, just some good walks a few times during the day, or whatever activity you're used to. And that you can all start now, because that will help in law school. Sleeping, sleeping well. I say this all the time, and people sort of laugh at it, but the science is there. We reason better, we think better, we process better, we analyze better when we have slept. So you have to develop sleep hygiene habits, is what the literature calls it. Well, um, can I interrupt? Sure. Going to bed at the same time. Start. I mean, if you're not, if you wake up a lot, or the kind of sleep hygiene you're talking about, as I've heard it, is, you know, number one, don't watch a shoot 'em up movie, as my wife calls it, before you go to bed. Right. Uh, yeah. Sort of calm down, and then. Go to bed at the same time, get up at the same time. You're going to be taking the bar starting, what, about, you want to get there at 8, right. probably on oh, the yeah. first day, if not before. So you want to be in a pattern where you, that's when you're sharp. Yes. So when do you need to go to bed? I know when I would have to go to bed. Uh, I don't know if Nat Gant sleeps at all because I get emails from him in all times. But uh, he would probably have to go to bed if he was taking the bar. Is that, is that? Uh, you know, that's one of the tips. There's also there's a lot of other tips about uh, how to enhance your sleep and being able to sleep. I think some of it too is just not being too worried about it because if you are up for an hour, do something relaxing. Find some tools that will get you back to sleep. A lot of times it's reading a novel or reading something rather than looking at a screen. A lot of the literature shows that the screens interfere with our sleep. Uh, maybe it's sitting in a quiet corner uh, in a rocking chair or something that just helps relax you. Uh, also getting into habits and routines 
going to bed at the same time if that works for you. Also, you know, some people like to have a hot bath or, as I said, read uh, something and have just sort of a wind down habit of something that will kind of cue you into this is sleep. There's some science about keeping rooms dark. Sometimes for some people that really helps controlling the light. But I think the most important thing is just to realize that sleep is important to put an emphasis on it and to start being a detective and determining what helps you to relax and what helps you to unwind and what helps you to kind of forget the work for a few hours and work on getting to sleep. And, and as far as the time goes in the book, I call it bar standard time. Wait, you have to be on from nine to five approximately. So if you are a night owl kind of person, what you have to do is eventually, and I say for sure by the month before the bar, switch over so that your body clock is on the times that you have to be on. And there's some tools with that. Oh, as I transition to uh, MC, uh, I'm going to hand this to you and take that for the students, but I'm going to ask, uh, do they serve lattes at the bar? <laughs> I mean, if you drink coffee the way I drink it, would I, would, would I have to learn to not... Uh, oh yes, yeah. I see where you're going. This yeah. is so important. When I said how many of you work in three hour blocks without having a drink of water, without uh, uh, taking bathroom breaks and other things, there are so many people who get used to focusing uh, while there's a cup of coffee in their hand. And you won't have that cup of coffee on the bar exam. So uh, super important. I, I do want to leave one a uh, few minutes for you, you did ask me one other question when we prepared for that uh, this session, and that was, what's the biggest mistake that people uh, can make? I don't know how I missed that. I, I would like to hit that for just a moment, and then we'll shift into the positives because this is a mistake that's so easily avoidable, uh, and that is not doing enough practice tests. This is by far and away the biggest mistake that people make studying for the bar, and the usual reason for it is that people say, well, I don't know enough law yet to do the practice tests. And there's all kinds of tips in Pass the Bar, including writing them open book at first and doing some other things to get you in that habit of writing practice tests. But there is no way that you would go to a big corporate presentation, for example, if you were pitching to a new client without rehearsing your presentation, would you? There's no way a Broadway show has its opening night without doing dozens, if not hundreds, of rehearsals. You cannot walk into the bar exam without doing practice tests and do yourself a service. You do yourself the biggest service by not digging in and doing those practice tests. And I'll say one more thing about this because I read a wonderful article recently about procrastination. And the theory was that many of us procrastinate not because we're lazy. I suspect none of you are, la are lazy or you wouldn't be here and you wouldn't be as successful as you are. One of the reasons we procrastinate is avoidance. We avoid things that are not comfortable. And trust me, writing out what should be hundreds of practice tests in 24 different subjects is not easy. But the more you do it, the better you get at it. And I'm crazy enough to tell you that I think it can actually be fun. I really do. And the more confident you get, the more exciting it can get because there will be no time in your life when you have more law in your head and you can answer more questions. And there's no greater moment than a couple weeks, week before the bar, when you get to that point where you say to yourself, examiners, throw anything at me, any fact pattern you want, I can reason through it. I can logically break it down. I can apply the rules of law that I've learned and I can reason to a logical conclusion and I can pass this exam. And it's a tool that will help you to be a better lawyer later on. So I, I do think that mistake is, is totally avoidable and, and I wanted to sort of mention that. Well, thank you for mentioning that. Dean Gant pulled rank. Uh, he wanted the question first <laughs> just a quick, and then I'll a quick, come back. Quick question. First of all, what you just said, Ms. Berman, is directly applicable to law school. Right. Right? That you should do practice exams before you take your exams in yes. law school. So that's a great ASP tip as well. One thing I just couldn't help but think as I'm sitting here is because I could 
imagine myself in this situation. I do everything that you're telling me to do. I prepare, I do practice exams, I've got a bar plan, a study plan, but I'm concerned about peaking on those two days in July. I'm worried about that, I'm concerned about that, because I can have a lot in my brain, but if I don't have optimal performance, and this is what I think would create anxiety in me, if I don't perform, I could know everything, but if I don't perform on those two days, I don't pass the bar exam. Mm -hmm. What tips, and I know this is ahead for all of, all of the students, but mm -hmm. what like a short tips could you, could you give today to help them to know they can peak on those two days? So I think the most important thing harkens back to this idea of practice tests. The more practice tests you do in a simulated environment, so under time conditions, in three hour blocks, the more you can be on that exam, channel your anxious nerves into power, and my little phrase with that is turn panic into power rather than paralysis. So notice that means own that you may have those anxious moments and don't let them tell you that they are going to bring you down to a less than peak okay. space. What they are going to do, you say, okay, I'm nervous now. This is good. This means I'm on. This means I'm alert. This means I care. Now let me go back to all my tools and remember the steps. I read the call of the question first, then I read the question, then I reread the call of the question, then I break it down. And I do, I remember the voices of my professors that believed in me, that believe still in me. And I channel all that and I focus on reading the questions and I think the peak performance then flows. It flows through your veins, not because of luck, because you've trained and prepared for this moment and it's yours. I don't know if that answers your question, Dean Gann, but I'm a strong believer that you need not worry about that, but you need tools to channel that reality into the moments when you, you'll knock it out. You'll do it. Okay, we're at 20 minutes left. Uh, Constantine, have you handed out the, uh, everybody should have a, if you didn't get a, no, a uh, Ralph will take it. We're going to have two of uh, Ms. Berman's books raffled off at the end, uh, and don't let me forget to do that. Uh, now it's time for questions and answers. Who wants to question ask behind you, I think. Is there a question? Okay. Here you go. Hello. I don't want you to give us away all the secrets oh, of the book. Let me, let me interrupt. We are taping this, so if you ask a question, you are implicitly agreeing to your <laughs> Awesome. I don't want you to give away all the secrets of your book, but is there a standardized schedule that people follow during ball, uh, bar prep season? And if there is, can you tell us what the optimal schedule looks like? Okay, that's a fantastic question. Did everybody hear it? It's what is the optimal schedule for studying? So I will say, like every other good lawyer question, it depends, right? Uh, and one of the threshold depends is whether you do have extensive outside commitments. Now, uh, we said, and we encourage you to do everything in your power not to have to work during bar review. But sometimes, some people do, and some people have child care obligations. Although one of the best advice I ever heard a dean give at orientation was make best friends with the grandparents if you do have children and send your kids to the grandparents for as much as you can during bar review. So uh, anybody who is a parent, there's a lot of information for uh, parents in the book and that goes for other uh, uh, care obligations as well. So the schedule idea has to be built around you. In order to make it successful, it has to be doable. The other thing is, just like uh, Professor Madison said about a habit, I also encourage schedules to evolve and build. So I said you should be studying in three hour blocks, not necessarily tomorrow. I want you to build up to a three hour block. So you may have to modify your schedule to increase it to look more like bar, uh, the bar days, so that your study days mirror bar days. 
So a sample study schedule, I have two sample study schedules in the book. One for non-working students who are dedicating full-time study to the bar, which again I think is optimal. And then the other one for people who are working. And the study schedule for folks who are full-time bar takers springboards from your bar review schedule and then adds to it. So adds to it exercise, self-care, some food prep of decent nutritious food, <laughs> and a good time to go to sleep. And it also builds in practice tests where the bar review may not have put in practice tests. And another piece it builds in is time to review materials that you know you didn't understand. Because you're not fooling anybody if you're sitting and pretending that you get something that you don't get. And really, this is some, a piece of advice I want to share, too, for people who are 1Ls and 2Ls. If you don't understand something, you have supportive faculty here. You have horn books in the library. Has anybody ever picked up a horn book? They're amazing. Yeah, they're, they're lethal weapons because they're heavy, right, if you pick up the actual book. But online, they're searchable, the indices, and you can sit quietly and review something that you didn't understand so that you make sure you get it. And uh, I think that building in a little time, even into bar review, so that you don't go in saying, I hope they won't test on fill in the blank. I never want anyone to go in hoping that something won't be tested on. So the schedules are kind of mirrored to be three hour blocks with good breaks in between, which is exactly what the bar has, with a, a dinner break and then some work afterward. They are also very much designed in my philosophy around what I call most productive time and least productive time. And what that asks you to do is assess when you're on, when you have the most energy. And when you have the most energy is when you want to do the toughest tasks, such as practice tests. When you have a little lower energy cycle, that may be a good time to do something that's inherently a little more passive, such as re-listening to reviewing a bar review lecture. And the um, schedules that work for people who are working have a similar type of a time frame, except the secret there is making sure it's distributed practice over time, getting up an hour earlier, working for an hour at lunch, working for an hour in the afternoon, rather than trying to cram in five or six hours on a weekend. You have to do a little bit of that too, but the idea is to balance out your time and make sure that you're not cramming, because as we've sort of said, cramming, you, you cannot cram for the bar exam. <laughs> Think about it that way. I like that. Yeah. Hi. Um, my question has to do with the last three weeks where I've heard that you, which three weeks kind of is, is a lot in two months of bar prep, um, when you move from eight hours a day to 12 plus hours a day and what your advice is for that. And then also for those of us that are studying in a city that will have commute times um, to get to our bar prep location, um, just how to use, utilize that time if you suggest that that time you know, is better used studying while you're driving or or if it's just time that you should take to breathe or what that looks like um i'm sure i can't be alone in that one no day, hopefully, so. yeah you're, you're definitely not alone in that and, and and again it's a little bit of an independent answer to that question what do you need it is a wonderful time while commuting to review a lecture you've already heard, not to try to focus so hard that you're listening for the first time because you don't want to have a traffic accident. Uh, it's also a wonderful time to listen to your own voice repeating rules. Hmm. And this has an incredible dividend. First of all, recording, voice recording programs, there's so many of them that are free, you can record the elements of all the causes of action and torts, for example. So the looking up the rule, recording it, and then playing it back in your own voice. And then you hear yourself and you say, wow, I know these rules. It's a very empowering process. It's great for the car. The other thing is if you have a, a partner to commute with, which some people do, sounds like you don't, but anyone who does, one person can hold flashcards while the other drives and you can test each other, which is a really helpful thing to do. But you can do that with the self-recording too. If you leave time, you say, battery, 
uh, and then you leave a little space for yourself to say a harmful or offensive contact and then uh, you uh, with the person of another and then you uh, repeat the rule in the on the tape so you could kind of customize tapes for yourself or listen to a recording uh, the other thing is what you said sometimes you do need a little downtime and that may be a time to practice breathing and to practice some of the mindfulness that will help you uh, recharge for the next go around as for the eight hour to 12 hour shift so I think that that's not necessarily, and I've seen people be more in, ramped up the whole time, but with breaks. I, I'm not necessarily, no, you can also build up, that's true. But I think that it's one of those wonderful gifts that again, if you're turning and channeling the anxiety in, and you're excited about the material, and that's a piece I wanna make sure we have a minute to touch on, you will find that doing those 12 hours are totally easy to do because you're into it. And, and, and if I might just for a second say that I spend a lot of time in the book saying, the bar exam is not torture. It's not a meaningless hazing ritual that somebody's making you do. It is a powerful tool to help you synthesize all those picky little rules that you learned in law school and put them into a cohesive set in your mind that brings you into the profession. And I think if you can view it as something that's positive, that's an opportunity, then you'll be more excited about the time that it takes to study. I'll sneak in this one. Uh, every bar prep company I've worked with says it's not the smartest students that always pass, it's the ones who do the work. Mm -hmm. And you, we see the progress. By the way, you don't want to opt out of letting me keep track of your progress because if you're running into a bump, I'll get you help. I'm not going to be yelling at you, I promise. Uh, but do you find that to be true? The, the, the folks that do the work pass the bar. Absolutely, absolutely. The, I, I always say that the bar exam is, is a little more like learning how to fix a really, really complicated sink than it is like painting a Picasso. What do I mean by that? It's not a God-given talent. It's not, uh, it is a doable, it is a doable process that you work for, you learn from, and you get better at with each practice test. And it's wholly doable. So every single person in the class, no matter where you are in the class, and especially if you got a lower grade in a particular class, that's a perfect time to rephrase and say, well, gosh, the second time I look at evidence, I'm going to really understand. I'm going to figure out what it was that didn't make sense to me. And it is going to feel awesome when it starts coming together and you see it. And that's a trust. That's a trust. But it's a trust but verify. Do the action. Do the work. And it will definitely pay off. And a, and a quick seconding of Professor Madison's point about the tools that the bar reviews are giving your professors to enable them to take care of you and notice when you may be struggling are super helpful. So don't opt out of anything and take full advantage and really uh, thank them and appreciate them for all that they're doing for you because they care uh, and they believe in you. Just a short announcement. Uh, we didn't have enough uh, uh, tickets, so uh, Melanie has been good enough to come up with some index cards. And uh, if anyone wants to fill it out, we'll put them down there, and I'll ask uh, Miss Berman to close her eyes when she picks. Uh, okay. She could get to it. Okay, we have a question over here. We've got about 10 minutes left. Back. Okay, good. Uh, you mentioned, Ms. Berman, uh, in passing that your book has a great deal of material for parents and how to handle their children during this particular time. I'm married, I have three children already, um, not expecting that uh, particular streak to end anytime soon. Um, so, 
what kind of advice would you have for people who live uh, farther away from their grand, from their parents and their children's grandparents? Because <coughs> my family and my wife's family live four hours away from us here. So do you have any particular advice uh, for people who are perhaps not well connected with the community and don't have the family um, help that they would have had if they were living uh, with their family? Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of advice in the book on that. I spent 15 years in a law school where the average age was 44. And all, I would say the overwhelming majority of my students had families. And many were caring for young children and elderly parents at the same time. So I have a, a, an enormous amount of respect for what you're juggling. So a couple of threshold things. First of all, know that your studying in front of your children is the greatest role modeling you can give them. And there are studies that show that students who are parents have more successful children than other people. Just having books in your home creates learners. So number one, lose any guilt if you have any guilt because you're actually doing them an enormous favor. That's one. Two, depending on how young your children are, and this is a little corny, but it is a tremendously useful thing on both ends. Uh, a, a child that knows your voice singing to them and you could be saying anything. You could be saying Rockabye Baby, or you could be reciting Prosser on Torts. <laughs> if you say it in a sing-song lovely voice, not only will your child resonate, but it imprints, science shows it imprints in your memory. I had a wonderful student in California who was gonna be taking the Florida bar. It's a crazy story, but she passed the Florida bar the first time. And next to Virginia, I think Florida is one of the hardest bars too. California is still the hardest, I think, but anyway. Um, super hard exam. So she was gonna spend five days driving across country shortly before the bar exam. So we plotted and we talked about it. And she recorded in a silly voice. I think she developed different accents for her recordings. Uh, herself reading the Florida rules and played them back the whole drive across the country and learning science. I, I, I later, I called her up a few years later, I read an article that said uh, either music or speaking in a, an accent will help imprint the material in a, in a more uh, permanent way. So you'll memorize by doing that. Um, another thing, again, depending on an age appropriate tool, uh, it, children who are old enough to read love to test their parents with flashcards. <laughs> and the only thing that you have to be aware of is that they might learn the rules faster than you do. <laughs> but they feel engaged in the process. It's a wonderfully helpful thing. Uh, and I have two other quick tips. One, have office hours that are family hours. And what I mean by this is, if you are going to be gone a lot of the day, and this applies to uh, a, a husband or wife or a girlfriend or boyfriend or anybody else who, who wants your time and needs your time. If they know they can depend on you every day from 7 to 8 p.m., they are more inclined to leave you alone during the rest of the day and be able to accept and understand dad's busy right now, but dad will be there for you 100% from 7 to 8 p.m. every night or you know 7 a.m. to 8 a.m. You could have breakfast, you don't have to have dinner. But have something, it will ground you and it will ground them. And last piece of advice for people with families, plan something wonderful after the bar that includes them. So that as a family you have a countdown and you look forward to a trip, uh, an event. Uh, I have had students who've taken their family to an amusement park. Whatever it is, just it will create buy-in, and it's a way of saying thank you to your loved ones for supporting you through this process. I hope those are helpful. This topic hasn't come up. Uh, you know, I found a lot of times pairing bar takers to be, a, I call them accountability partners. Yes. I can see people that would hold each other accountable in a, in a way that's not harsh. What do you think of that? I think that's a wonderful thing, and, and I'll add a piece about it. I think it's very important to understand yourself and how you learn best. If a person tells you this is the way everybody studies for the bar exam, there's no cookie cutter. It's not the exact same thing. Learning 
uh, styles have been debunked in the sense that I am not purely a visual learner or purely an audio learner. I am a mixture. We are all mixtures. But some of us like to study in quiet. Others like to study and thrive in a coffee shop. Wherever you are at your peak, focus on you. It's your bar. You're going to go in there and perform, and these are tools that are going to help you for the rest of your life, too. So just look at your background. Are you a person who used an accountability buddy for exercise, for nutrition? If that's the case and it worked for you, it'll probably work for studying. If you got a lot out of a study group, study in groups, help yourselves, explain problems to each other. But if you're a person who really studies better on your own and people around you as much as you love them distract you, own that as well. So I think really it's important, and I think that's a wonderful question, Professor Madison, and I think it's a very, very personalized answer. Uh, and, and it's not rocket science. Is this doable? You've all got this. So what's your pass rate again going to be? 100. A little all louder. Right, you know, all right. All right, okay. we're to the time of the raffle. You got, you got them all? Okay, you got them. So, uh, quick note, the, the publisher is sending the book to Professor Madison. They're not here, so he's going to take your name, and I think they're supposed to arrive at a UPS today. Well, so you'll have, two, to, right? you'll have to make an appointment to come by his office right. or make it your business to see him to collect the books. Right. There are there are are yes, there are. <laughs> All right. If you just close oh, your oh, eyes coming. and... Pick. Here we go, a couple more. Oh. You want to you let the dean pick? Well, well yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. hey, you've hey. been around law schools a long time now. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't want anyone yeah. accusing me of yeah. being biased Absolutely. since it's my book. All right. I pledge the fair and impartial. <laughs> I love it. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 This is a little bit embarrassing, though, because I want everyone to have the book. Aww. So, let's see. All right, I'm looking away, digging down deep. Right. Okay, 134. Well, congratulations. We can we will get together. Uh, Too much fun. Uh, this is is this one? Yeah. Okay. That's one that actually was one put in to the card. Uh, Christopher Hardwell. Wow. <laughs> okay, well, thank you. So if I, if I could add one note, uh, I am thank in the you. middle right now, toward the end, of a second edition of the book. So this is great for the, for the three L's. Every, oh, everything in it is still totally valid. There's just a few extra tips. So for one L's and two L's, uh, if, if you'll have me back, I'd love to come back again next year, the year after, and raffle off some uh, of the new edition. And from the bottom of my heart, uh, I'm not going to wish you good luck, because this is not about luck. I am going to thank you for joining this noble profession. I am going to thank you for dedicating yourselves to the rule of law and to making the world a better place. And we are